Finally, we will be looking at chapter 5.3, Radical Equations. So, we've been looking at uh, expressions. Expressions are essentially one side of an equation. Now our equations, or expressions rather, will equal something and will transform into an equation. Oops, let's just fix this. Radical equations will contain a variable, and it is our job to isolate that variable in order to solve the equation. Stating restrictions on a variable in a radical equation can also help us identify invalid solutions. Finally, we should always be verifying our solutions. So restrictions. I started talking about restrictions at the end of 5.2. Now we need to make sure that we're identifying restrictions on all of our radical expressions and equations. So the first question is, what numbers can we not have under the radical sign? Well, under a radical sign, we've talked about this. We need to have a positive number or zero. And that's true for all even numbered uh, indexes, or radicals with even numbered indexes, rather. If we have a cubed root, or a fifth root, or a seventh root, or an odd root, we can have a negative, a positive, or a zero. All right. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that we can't be dividing by zero. So how do we state restrictions? Well, a restriction would be on, say, root x. We would say x is greater than or equal to zero. x is an element of the reals, meaning that zero can be a solution and any number greater than zero can be a solution. What we need to realize as well is that um, the restrictions on the restrictions are also the domain of our radical expression and equations. So if we were to graph one of these radical, radical equations, um, our domain is all values of x that are uh, possible. Okay, so thinking back to quadratics, our domain is all the possible x values. So realize that restrictions also tie in to domains. I'm giving you this hint because it may appear on a test. Okay, so domain and values of x are the same thing. So, what are the restrictions on the following function? Well, we know that underneath that radical sign, we need to have a zero or a positive number. So, f of x is equal to root x minus 2. x minus 2 is greater than or equal to zero. We need to state restrictions on x, though. So, we're going to isolate x by adding 2 to both sides. x is greater than or equal to 2. x is an element of the reals. All right, now what does this mean the domain is? Well, the domain is this exact thing. This is my domain. And what about my range? Well, my range is similar. It isn't some, I don't know why I'm saying that. <laughs> my range is, well, what can what values can this be? Okay, so think about this. Can the, the, my y be a negative number? So can the square root of some number equal a negative number? Well, no. So my range is y is greater than or equal to 0. y is an element of the reals. All right. What we need to keep in mind is when multiplying or dividing both sides of an inequality by a negative number, you need to reverse the direction of the inequality symbol. So for example, when we have 3 minus 5n is greater than or equal to 0, we isolate n by subtracting 3 from both sides and then dividing by negative 5. As soon as we divide by that negative 5, that inequality sign flips. All right? You should always check your restriction by plugging it back in and ensuring that it equals um, 0 in this case. Okay? So just always verify your restriction by substituting it back in. Now, what are we going to do here? We're going to do two things. We're going to state the restriction, and then we're going to solve for x. Well, how do we solve for x? Well, this is algebra. All we do is work backwards in order to isolate x. So 7 equals the square root of 5 minus 2x. Let's start by stating that restriction. So I know 5 minus 2x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So there's a couple ways that I can solve this algebraically. I can subtract 5 from both sides. Negative 2x is greater than or equal to negative 5. Divide both sides by negative 2, which then flips my inequality sign. So x 
is less than or equal to 5 over 2. Of course, we could do this without flipping that sign by adding 2x to both sides and then dividing by 2 to get 5 over 2 is greater than or equal to x. So my restriction is x is less than or equal to 5 over 2. x is an element of the reals. Now, what was I talking about earlier? I was talking about finding invalid solutions. So if we complete this question and find one of our solutions does not fit within that restriction, then that solution is invalid. So how do we isolate x here? Well, first, I need to get rid of that square root sign. So in bed mass, that is my exponent step. We have no brackets, so let's get rid of those exponents. So square roots count as that exponent step. So we're going to square both sides in order to get rid of that square root. Now I'm left with 49 equals 5 minus 2x. From here, I subtract 5 from both sides. 44 equals 2, negative 2x rather. And then from here, I divide by negative 2 on both sides. And I get 20, negative 22 is equal to x. Now, does that fit my restriction? Yes. But is it a solution? I need to verify my solution before I can move on. So 7 is equal to the square root of 5 minus 2 times negative 22. 7 is equal to the square root of 5 minus negative 44. 7 is equal to 5 plus 44. 7 is equal to the square root of 49. 7 is equal to 7. So my verification confirms that x is equal to negative uh, 22, which confirms that this is the solution to my problem. And of course, it always gets more complicated. So in this case, in the second question, rather, we have negative 8 plus, and this is written wrong, sorry, the square root of 3y divided by 5 equals negative 2. So take off this here. It should just be the square root of 3y over 5. All right, <clears throat> so what are our restrictions? Well, our restrictions on y would be any value that would make this fraction equal to a negative number. So y can be 0, y can be positive numbers, but y cannot be negative 1, because as soon as we make y a negative number, this whole root would be negative. Um, so y is greater than or equal to 0 because even negative 0 0.00000001 would make this negative. So essentially y is greater than or equal to 0 is, says y is a positive number. Now we go through the process of isolating x. So this time around we're going to add 8 to both sides. We'll be left with square root of 3y over 5 equals 6. Then we are going to square both sides in order to get rid of that square root. So 3y over 5 equals 36. And then we're going to multiply both sides by 5 to get rid of that divided by 5. So 3y is equal to 180. And finally we're going to divide by 3 to get y by itself. y is equal to 60. Now this is allowed because our restriction tells us it's allowed, but we still need to verify. So let's plug it in. So verify negative 8 plus the square root of 3 times 60 divided by 5 should equal negative 2. Negative 8 plus the square root of 180 divided by 5 should equal negative 2. 180 divided by 5 is 36. So square root of 36 should equal negative 2. Negative 8 plus 6 should equal negative 2. Negative oops, 2 equals negative 2. Therefore, my verification is correct. So y equals 60 is the solution to my problem. All right, so simply applying algebra, isolating that variable, and also stating the restriction. 
finally pause and practice. Finally, I don't know. I said finally. <laughs> finally, you get to pause and practice on your own. All right. So pause, practice, come back, and we'll work through this question together. So state my restriction, and then solve for x. So 5 plus the square root of 2x minus 1 equals 12. So under that radical sign, my value needs to be greater than or equal to 0. We're going to isolate that x. So x needs to be greater than or equal to 1 half. Now let's go through the process of isolating x. So I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides to get the square root of 2x plus 1 is equal to 7. Then I'm going to square both sides to get 2x plus 1 equals 49. Then I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides to get 2x equals 48. And finally divide by 2 to get x equals 24. Really, none of this should be too new to you because you know how to do algebra. Maybe only getting rid of that square root might be a newer skill. All right, so x needs to be greater than or equal to 1 half. Well, it is. So let's just verify that by plugging it back in. 5 plus the square root of 2 times 24 minus 1 should equal 12. 5 plus 48 minus 1 should equal 12. 5 plus the square root of 49 should equal 12. 5 plus 7 should equal 12. And 12 should equal 12. Therefore, I am correct. Now, like I said, sometimes you're going to have an extraneous solution, an invalid solution. Sometimes these extraneous solutions can be found by finding the restrictions on m or on the variable. Other times, um, they're found when we're plugging our value back in. So remember, restrictions are values that are not allowed. An extraneous solution is a solution that we found through algebra, but it's not necessarily valid. Okay, so m minus root 2m plus 3 is equal to 6. So we want to, oops, we want to isolate m. So in this, in this type of question, when you have a root uh, or you have a binomial where one of the terms is a root, you want to isolate that root. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm actually going to move the root over to the right so that I have a positive root. So I'm going to add 2m plus 3 to both sides, or root 2m plus 3 rather. So I'll have m is equal to 6 plus root 2m plus 3, and then I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. So m minus 6 is equal to root 2m plus 3. Before I go any further, I know that 2m plus 3 must be greater than or equal to 0. 2m must be greater than or equal to negative 3. m must be greater than or equal to negative 3 over 2 or 1.5. All right, now going back to my equation, how do I get rid of that square root? Well, I'm going to square both sides, and this is where it becomes a bit complicated. Some of you might go, oh, m squared minus 6, six squared. No, wrong. We <laughs> need to do m minus 6 times n minus 6, which is the distributive property. On the right, it is simple. It'll just be 2m plus 3. So m times m is m squared. m times negative 6 is negative 6m. Negative 6m plus 36 equals 2m plus 3. Now what do I need to do? Well, now I'm working with quadratics. So this is where we need that strong chapter 3 and 4 knowledge. I'm going to move everything over to the left. So m squared minus 12m plus 36 equals 2m plus 3. Subtract 2m from both sides. m squared minus 14m. Subtract 3 from both sides. Plus 33 equals 0. All right, hopefully you see are able to do that on your own. And from here, what does this mean? Well, I'm solving for m. So when I'm solving for m in a quadratic, what do I need to do? Well, I can factor. I can graph. Or I can use the quadratic formula. Now, for the sake of practicing skills that we need to know, 
I'm going to apply the quadratic formula in order to solve for m. I'm also going to take over my restriction just so I can see afterwards what I need to be doing or, or what solution might be valid. These things make sense in my mind and then I say them and I realize they make zero sense. All right, so quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Negative, negative 14 plus or minus the square root of negative 14 squared, that's in brackets though, minus 4ac divided by 2a. 14 plus or minus the square root of negative 14 squared is 196 minus 4 times 1 times 33, which is 132 all over 2. Continue to simplify. 14 plus or minus 196 divided by 132 is root 64 divided by 2. 14 plus or minus 8 divided by 2. 7 plus or minus 4. All right, so my solutions then are 11 and 3. Is that correct? Okay, and again, this could have been done in two different ways. You could have done um, 14 plus 8 is 22 divided by 2 is 11. 14 minus 8 is 6 divided by 2 is 3. Either way, you'll end up with two solutions, 11 and 3. And look at that, both fit in with our restriction. So these must be the two solutions, right? Wrong. Again, I told you, make sure you always verify. So we are going to take our original equation, m minus the square root of 2m plus 3, was it? Yes, equals 6. And we'll do that over here. m minus the square root of 2m plus 3 equals 6. Here we'll plug in 11 for m. So 11 minus 2 times 11 plus 3 should equal 6. And over here we'll type, uh, plug in 3 for m. All right, let's simplify and verify. 11 minus the square root of 2 times 11 is 22 plus 3 is 25 should equal 6. 11 minus 5 should equal 6. 6 equals 6. So we just verified that 11 is a solution. Cool. What about 3? Well, 3 minus 2 times 3 is 6 plus 3 is 9. 3 minus the square root of 9 is 3. Well, 3 minus 3 is 0. 0 doesn't equal 6. So therefore, 3 is not a solution. It's an extraneous solution. All right, and that happened because somewhere along the way, our math allowed us to get that 3, but that 3 doesn't actually fit in our original equation. Okay, so that's an extraneous solution. Uh, one other skill we'll need to know is what happens if we have two radicals in an equation? Well, it becomes a whole lot, well, I shouldn't say a whole lot harder, it becomes a little more complicated. So when solving an equation with two radicals, we must work the equation in such a way that gets rid of one radical uh, and then eventually gets rid of that second radical. I'm going to give you a tip. You can do it either way. You can isolate either radical. But what I always do is I isolate the most complicated radical first. It makes solving this much easier. So root 3 plus j plus root 2j minus 1 equals 5. So isolate one radical. Why would we do that? Well, if we squared both sides right now, we'd end up with root 3 plus j plus root 2j minus 1 times root 3 plus j plus root 2j minus 1 equals 25. Well, this looks really complicated. If we isolate one radical, and actually that wouldn't necessarily get rid of a radical, it would actually just create more radicals. By isolating a radical, so we're going to isolate 2j minus 1, or root 2j minus 1, and then we'll have 5 minus root 3 plus j. By isolating this radical on the left, we're now going to get rid of this radical sign. So let's square the left side and square the right. What are we left with? 
Well, on the left, we're left with 2j minus 1. On the right, we are going to have to use foiling. All right. So 5 times 5 is 25. 5 times negative 3 plus j. Sorry, 5 times negative root 3 plus j is negative 5 root 3 plus j. Negative 3 negative root 3 plus j times 5 is negative 5 root 3 plus j and negative root 3 plus j times negative root 3 plus j is positive 3 plus j and we're going to leave that in brackets all right and 2j minus 1 on this side now we're going to go through and simplify everything so 2j minus 1 equals 25 minus 10 root 3 plus j plus 3 plus j. Well, that 3 and that 25 can be combined to be 28. Now I'm going to move everything but my radical over to the left. So I'm going to subtract 28 from both sides. And I'm going to subtract j from both sides. So I'll be left with j minus 29 is equal to negative 10 root 3 plus j. Now what I'm going to do here is, I you can divide off the negative 10 if you'd like. Uh, you just need to know how to work with fractions that are squared. Or you can just square the left and the right again. So square the left, square the right. We will end up with j minus 29 times j minus 29. And over here, negative 10 squared is 100 times 3 plus j. Okay, because negative 10 times negative 10 is 100. Root 3 plus j times root 3 plus, 3 plus j is the square root of 3 plus j squared. The square roots cancel each other. The square cancels out the um, square, rather, and we're left with 3 plus j. Okay, so if that doesn't make sense how to get there, let me know. We need to work on some of your uh, exponent work. And then on the left, we are uh, using foiling. So j times j is j j squared minus 29j minus 29j plus 841 is equal to 100 times 3 is 300 plus 100j. Alright, so this is also just a lot of review of quadratics, so make sure you have that strong foundation in quadratics. Now I'm going to move everything over to the left. So j squared minus 29j minus 29j is negative 58j, but I'm also subtracting that 100 from the right. So I'm going to end up with negative 158j, 841 minus 300 from the right is plus 541 equals 0. And again, we're solving for j, so we need to use one of our strategies here, either factoring, quadratic formula, or graphing. I'm looking for those x-intercepts. Um, in this case, I'm going to use the quadratic formula. Oops. Oh my goodness. So j squared minus 158j plus 541 equals 0. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. That's on your formula sheet, but you should be using it enough where you might start to remember it. Negative negative 158 plus or minus the square root of negative 158 squared minus 4 times a times c divided by 2a. There's going to be quite a bit of simplifying in this process. Just to correct there, that's actually 2 times 1. All right, so 158 plus or minus the square root of negative 158 squared 
is 24,964 minus 4 times 1 times 54. Oh, sorry, times 4 times 1 times 541, rather. So minus 2,164, all divided by 2. And again, just going through this process of simplification, the 22,800 divided by 2. Can that be square rooted nicely? Nope. So in this case, um, I would be fine with a decimal as long as you just tried uh, your hardest to keep that decimal as close to accurate as possible. Ideally, you would make this into a mixed radical. So 22, let's see what we can do here. So this would be 158 plus or minus 100. times 228. We can break this 228 up into 4 times 57. All right. So we'd end up with 158 plus or minus 10 times 2 root 57 divided by 2. 158 plus or minus 20 root 57 divided by 2. Everything gets divided by 2. So we have 79 plus or minus 10 root 57. Now those are two solutions. We need to verify both solutions. Realize if you turn this into a decimal, when you plug this back into our original equation, um, you're not going to get exactly 0. Or you're not going to get exactly 5 because we rounded. If you plug in this exact value into our original equation, you will get the right answer. So let me just write this down. 79 plus 10 root 57. And we're plugging that back into our original equation of root 3 plus j plus root 2j minus 1. And it should equal 5. So here is where I would use my calculator to verify. I would plug this in for j or plug that decimal in. So I'm going to plug in the decimal, 79 plus 10 square root 57. So our two solutions are j is equal to 154.5, j is equal to 3.5. Okay, so I'm plugging both of these in uh, to verify. So let's plug in this first one. 3 plus 154.5, the square root of that, plus the square root of 154.5, or 2 times, I should probably write this out, 3 plus 154.5, plus the square root of 2 times 154.5, minus 1 should equal 5. Okay, so this will equal 12.5. And again, I'm rounding, so I'm going to be losing some accuracy. 2 times 154.5 minus 1. The square root of that is 17.55. Either way, we know this is going to be about 2930. 30 does not equal 5. Therefore, this is an extraneous solution. Let's try with 3.5. So the square root of 3 plus 3.5 plus the square root of 2 times 3.5 minus 1 should equal 5, or in this case, about 5 since we rounded. So the square root of this is 2.55. The square root of 6 is about 2.45. Well, this equals 5, and this equals 5. Therefore, we are correct. J equals 3.5. Again, we would get an exact value if we used those radicals. Um, in this case, I'd have a bit of leniency. 
for you not stating this in simplified radical form, just because it's not the easiest. Uh, that being said, you have the skills to do it. We've been looking at radicals enough. Uh, but either way, I want to see that you've gone through the process of identifying 3.5 as your value of j and identifying 154.5 as a value of j, but then through, simple, uh, through verification, stating that 3.5 is actually our only valid solution. All right. And finally, a pause and practice for yourself, and then we'll do one word problem together. So state your restrictions, solve for x, verify. All right, so I'm going to isolate that. Oh, this would be 3x, sorry. I'm going to isolate the hard, the, the most complicated radical on one side. So I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides to get 2 plus root 3x is equal to root 5x plus 4. I'm doing this because when I square, this is easier to square rather than the alternative. So I'll be left with 5x plus 4 on the right and 2 plus root 3x times 2 plus root 3x. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2 root 3x plus 2 root 3x plus root 9x squared equals 5x plus 4. And again, just simplifying, combining like terms. So 4 plus 4 root 3x plus 3x, that simplifies, equals 5x plus 4. Leave the radical on one side, move everything else to the other side. So minus 3x, minus 3x, minus 4, minus 4. I'm left with 4 root 3x is equal to 2x. And now I'm going to square both sides because I'm going to get rid of that square root one last time. I am left with 4x squared. And over here I'm left with 16 root 9x squared. Again, 9x squared simplifies to 3x equals 4x squared. I have 48x equals 4x squared. Move everything over to one side. 0 equals 4x squared minus 48x. Uh, you can use the quadratic equation. I'm going to try and factor it this time. So 0 is equal to 4x times x minus 12. So my solutions for x are x equals 0 and x equals 12. What did I not do in the very beginning? Well, I forgot to state my restrictions. So looking at my first x value, this is telling me that x needs to be greater than or equal to 0. Looking at my second x value, I know that 5x plus 4 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. 5x needs to be greater than or equal to negative 4. x needs to be greater than or equal to negative 4 over 5. All right. That being said, looking at both of these, we need to go with the highest restriction. So my restriction on this is x is greater than or equal to 0. x is an element of the reals. Why do we need to go with the higher restriction? Well, because this says that negative 0.5 would be allowed. Well, negative 0.5 wouldn't be allowed because it uh, falsifies this restriction or it contradicts this restriction. That being said, both of our solutions fit within this restriction. So we need to then verify by plugging them back in. So 7 plus the square root of 3x is equal to the square root of 5x plus 4. We determined that x could equal 0, x could equal 12. We'll verify this by plugging it in. I'm sorry, this should be plus 5. So let's plug in 0 and see if it works. 7 plus the square root of 3 times 0 equals the square root of 5 times 0 plus 4 plus 5. 7 plus the square root of 0 equals 0 plus 4, so the square root of 4 plus 5. 7 plus 0 is 7. Root 4 is 2 plus 5. 7 equals 7. So 0, x equals 0 is a solution to this problem.
that doesn't mean that x equals 12 isn't a solution. So while we have found some cases where one of our solutions was extraneous, there could be two solutions as well. So let's just verify by plugging in 12. 7 plus the square root of 3 times 12 should equal 5, or the square root of 5 times 12 plus 4 plus 5. 7 plus the square root of 36 is equal to 6, the square root of 60 plus 4 plus 5. 7 plus 6 is equal to the square root of 64 plus 5. 7 plus 6 is 13 is equal to 8 plus 5. 13 is equal to 13. Look at that. We verify that x equals 12 is also a solution. All right, so we identified two solutions in this case. And that's allowed. That's perfectly fine. And finally, this is actually one of the easier concepts in this chapter, is plugging in values into radical equations. So when an object is dropped from the top of a building that is 50 feet tall, the object will be h feet above the ground after t seconds. How far above the ground will the object be after one second? So what we need to do is take this equation and plug in one second. The hardest part is just if we plug it in the wrong spot. So we know that t represents time, one second is time, therefore t equals one. So when t equals one, what does h equal is essentially what we're asking. So 1 is equal to 1 quarter, the square root of 50 minus h. Now we just want to isolate 1. So we're going to divide both sides by 1 quarter to get 4 is equal to root 50 minus h. We're going to square both sides to get 16 is equal to 50 minus h. We're going to subtract 50 to get negative h is equal to negative 34. Divide by negative 1 to get h is equal to 34. So essentially after one second, our object will be 34 meters above the ground. Or it will have fallen 34 meters. Okay, so can we verify that? Well, we can verify it by plugging it back into our original equation. So our original equation was time is equal to 1 quarter square root 50 minus height. So let's just verify that if our height is 34, that our time will be uh, 1. So time equals 1 quarter square root of 16. Time equals 1 quarter times 4. Time equals 1. So this time we verified that our height was correct by plugging it back in and seeing if our t value matched our original t value. Another way that we could have solved this problem was to isolate t and plug in our values. So you should also be able to isolate or rewrite equations. So how do we state this in terms of height? Well that would be t divided by 1 quarter which is the same as 4t so 4t equals 50 minus h. I'm going to square both sides. So 16t squared equals 50 minus h. I'm going to subtract 50 from both sides. And then I'm going to divide everything by negative 1. So negative 16t squared plus 50 should equal my height. So I've also rearranged this equation, so now I can plug in times to get height. So if I plug in time as one second, what will I end up with? Well, this is negative 16 plus 50, which is 34. All right, so there's two ways that we can do this. We can also ask word problems based on, or other problems based off of this equation. So what is the maximum height that the um, object can fall? Well, logically looking at the problem, the top of the building is 50 feet tall, so the maximum height that it can fall is 50 feet. Mathematically, we have a restriction of h is greater than or equal to 50. So we can look at that math and therefore state that the maximum height is 50, or we can use logic from the word problem and state that the maximum height the object can fall from is 50. Um, so h is... Uh, less than or equal to 50. 
That being said, we also know that h is greater than or equal to zero. Why? Well, again, logically in the question, if the height is, um, well, we can't have a negative height, right? We can't have a height of negative two. So therefore, we could state a domain on this question such that h is greater than or equal to zero, but less than or equal to 50. So we didn't, we didn't come to this conclusion mathematically. We came through it through logic and math. And h is an element of the reals, meaning it's all numbers between 0 and 50. All right, so I hope you see how you can apply these formulas, but also analyze how they work. At the end of 5.3, you need to be able to say, I can solve for a variable in a radical equation. I can rearrange formulas to isolate a variable. I can state restrictions. I can find extraneous solutions. And I can solve word problems involving radical equations. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Otherwise, you're done Chapter 5. Congratulations.